Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, Devin. So nice to e-meet you. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to seeing you on May 1st. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining us this morning for Sheer Partners Bioblast. We've had an opportunity to collaborate with BioBuzz and Life Science Cares uh, for the event that's occurring at the Curtis. And, you know, really just glad to get your perspective and hear your insights uh, being the leader for life sciences at the Philadelphia Department of Commerce. Thank you. Um, so I'm very excited that this uh, position has been created. Um, I've been doing research in Philadelphia for a long time, of course, until I came to commerce a year and a half ago. And we are just a ecosystem of, of firsts, so many firsts, yeah. first cell therapy, first gene therapy, mRNA technology, first hospital, first zoo, you know, so it's very exciting that Philadelphia recognized how important the sciences are to our ecosystem and how we're affecting the greater globe, honestly, with our cures and treatments. So happy yeah, to be abs- here. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to have you. And, uh, you know, Philadelphia kind of at large, uh, in particular, the public sector and economic development really kind of doubled down on the life science sector in 2019. Uh, you know, that time it was very focused on cell and gene therapy. And obviously, Philadelphia has emerged as this um, CGT hub. And, mm-hmm. you know, we'll get into a bit more about the tech hub designation as a precision medical hub and everything that comes with that. But, you know, as you think about your role here about a year and a half in and you know, there's been a lot of work that's been done over the last several years from an infrastructure development perspective and, you know, recruitment and retention perspective. But for those less familiar, you know, can you give us some additional backgrounds in terms of your role, what you're doing at the Department of Commerce and and uh, how you all are supporting economic activity uh, in the bioeconomy in, in Philly? Sure. So within the Department of Commerce, and not to be confused with the Chamber of Commerce, we work with them as well. Um, I am in the business development unit and we are responsible for attraction and retention of businesses to Philadelphia. We have several sector directors. And so my sector is is life sciences and biotech. Um, So commerce is the catalyst, I think, for attracting and growing a diverse set of businesses in Philadelphia and revitalizing neighborhoods and commercial corridors. And again, my responsibility for that is life sciences. I think when this position came about, um, one thing that was happening is we found that private lab space where people like spin out and go to innovate was really um, at a premium. There just wasn't that much. And I believe there was a study that was completed that showed that we had something like, I don't know, maybe somewhere in the high 90s of occupancy. And so, you know, now we're on a different trajectory and we have different priorities in the sense that we have enough lab real estate. Right now you can get everything from a brownfield to an already spec building, you know, if that's whatever you need and everything in between. Um, But now we're thinking more about human capital um, and, and investment. Philadelphia um, definitely needs a lot more local investment and VC dollars to keep these um, studies going and to create cures and treatments for the patients. Um, But the human capital part is amazing. Um, We've had several training programs that have piloted uh, training folks who just want to be in science. These are like adult learners. And it's fascinating. iAvance Therapeutics was the first cohort or sort of the proof of concept. And they trained a cohort of people who applied for the program. Um, and now they're working in biomanufacturing. I mean, I'll, I'll just never forget because I, I went by iAvance the day that they graduated and one of them, you know, is an artist. And so the fact that we have an artist working in science is amazing. And um, the reason this is so important to me, this whole workforce piece is one, This is a way you can get people without advanced degrees. I should say that like that whole cohort, I don't think any of them had advanced degrees. Um, But this is a way they can have family sustaining wages, which really changes your trajectory in life and how you take care of your family and how you can take care of your family. And this goes along with Mayor Parker's 
economic opportunity for all. It's the one place where I see that we can create that economic opportunity for all. An example is I have, you know, I was at Penn and I I developed the uh, primate program for Jim Wilson's gene therapy program. And I had a person who worked as a husbandry tech there. And that's the person who takes care of the animals and feeds them, who is now like an associate director in gene therapy with one year of college. So it's amazing how far you can go. And if you're someone who wanted to go to college and maybe just couldn't afford it, when I worked, you know, at another company in the suburbs, you know, I signed a lot of waivers paying for their education. Um, You know, it's you can go really far in science and you can go really far and um, be able to sustain, sustain your family and sustain yourself and have more opportunity as you know, to move up the ladder. Yeah, I I completely agree. And, you know, I think part of what you said too, that resonates with me is just the fact that you have an artist uh, in becoming a scientist and obviously growing that space, but science and art aren't too far, far off when you think about left brain, right brain, and, you know, I want to come back to talking with you about workforce development, some of the initiatives that you all are running out of um, the Department of Commerce. But, you know, part of what I what I think is so impressive about your background is that you were a scientist and you've sort of come full circle where, where now you're supporting uh, the city of Philadelphia in recruiting, attracting scientific companies. And so we'd love to learn a little bit more just about your background and how you found you know yourself in this role today, given your experience working with UPenn, helping develop their senior, uh, mRNA program. Um, and so, you know, again, would just love to get more insights there. Yeah. So I was in gene therapy at Penn. So it was I actually worked with the two scientists that developed the first FDA approved gene therapy to cure a form of inherited blindness. Um, but, you know, I always wanted to be a veterinarian since I was five years old. And my plan is always to be a small animal veterinarian with a clinic with, you know, like maybe a grooming facility upstairs and a clinic downstairs. And I did that for a while. And then I realized owning your own business is really hard. And maybe this is not what I want to do is because you really have to devote your whole time. And um, so then I ended up coming to Pennsylvania to do a postdoctoral fellow in lab animal medicine. And so lab animal veterinarians are the veterinarians who take care of research animals. Um, they're protected under federal law, most of them, and we have to have veterinarians and vet technicians to take care of them um, if they get ill, et cetera. And in doing that, I found that the my favorite part was was the monkeys and like, or were the monkeys. And so I really enjoyed working with them And I literally accepted a job with Merck, but my postdoc wasn't over. Um, And a headhunter called out of nowhere and described this position at Penn that I didn't understand. And I said, could you get me a better job description? (laughs) He did. And meanwhile, I'd scheduled my interview and I actually called them to cancel the interview. I said, I don't understand this job. I already have a job with Merck. I don't want to waste your time. And they said, no, 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 you know, monkeys come in. You do, yeah. do the So um, anyway, that led into my career in research. Best decision I ever made. Um, Jim Wilson was really uh, great to work for, taught me so much. He basically said, you know, you know, the clinical piece, you know, the animals will teach you the science and that's what they did. And so it was a really good decision. Um, and then I, you know, went away from there to try teaching. I always wanted to try teaching. So I did that. Um, they're gods. I won't do that ever again. <laughs> so, and I ended up, honestly, in 2018, I ended up at G- Emory in Georgia Tech. I actually left Philadelphia to do mild traumatic brain injury research in children. And I came back um, in 2020. I just, I found it really hard to get my research done there compared to Philadelphia. So that's one plug, I can say, for doing research here in this mid-Atlantic Northeast area, just to me, it just moves faster. Um, And it's just, I found it easier and more collaborative, put it that way, definitely a more collaborative environment. Anyway, I, I ended up with commerce, I should say, because I've never been afraid to take a risk with my career. So I've tried, you know, clinical medicine, research, two different types of research, teaching, 
Um, I even worked at a CRO when I came back, a contract research organization when I came back from um, Atlanta or living in Atlanta. And I, this position, again, I wasn't sure, but I talked to the person who had the position before me. And what he helped me understand is all the volunteering I'm doing in my community and all these things I'm doing in my community is economic development. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe I can do this because I know the science. You know, I'm kind of doing economic development. And as I talked to the department more and more, I thought I can take this on. So yeah, here I am a year and a half later. <laughs> yeah, incredible background. And they're lucky to have you. Uh, and obviously, you know a lot about Philly Selling Points, the importance of having access to premier R1 research institutions, the likes of UPenn. You obviously yeah. have Drexel, CHOP, the Y Star Institute, to name a few that have helped contribute to the legacy of the local bioeconomy. And so, you know, we generally talk about ecosystems, you know, using sort of the four pillars, which has become kind of more common now, which is, you know, access to IP and technologies could be spin outs out of university or, you know, as companies go through strategic M&A and maybe a few scientists at the bench get together and license technology is, is one thing we look for. Um, there's the facilities, the real estate and infrastructure piece, um, certainly the access to talent, and access to capital. And so, um, you know, I heard you say, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you don't think the organic growth has would have occurred in Philadelphia without the proximity to resources. I think it was a tech uh, uh, a tech technically article uh, yeah. link on it. Um, yeah. But talk to me about the assets that Philly has today. And and what makes it so attractive as an emerging life science hub? Yeah. So like those four pillars that we talk about are, are you know, real estate, institutions, human capital and investment. And um, we definitely have the real estate today. That's definitely an advantage is you can come into Philly and you can share a space with someone or you can dive right in and build out your own building, you know? So that's one thing we have. Um, we have the institutions um, and they're just growing and growing between Drexel and Temple and UPenn and LaSalle and everyone in between. Yeah. Um, that's great. But this human capital piece um, is the piece that we're growing out at this point. We realize that Philadelphia was is a space where we had like great manufacturing. And um, we manufactured, I guess, steel, mostly Pittsburgh, but, you know, we did here too, I believe, textiles, things like that. So the new age of manufacturing is this biomanufacturing. We, with precision medicine, this is medicine where you target a person's individual cells and disease. So their cells are used to cure their body. And we need someone to bio manufacture those cells. And so I think this is the new age of manufacturing for Philadelphians, especially for Phil underserved Philadelphians, um, where we can see lives improved and, and start employing folks in science who maybe thought they couldn't do science. Um, but investment is the piece where we really, um, I think the entire world is struggling at this piece right now. I have to say, Philadelphia's asset is that one of the assets is that we do great science here. So our VC, although it dropped off in the last year or so, we still aren't seeing the same drops that other life science hubs are seeing. So I think workforce um, and investment dollars and future investment dollars with our two new administration, political administrations, um, both at the state level and locally, um, are two assets that we have. Everyone recognizes that this is our moment in time and that, you know, and our government recognizes that they have to pivot and really get behind science, not just in Philadelphia, but across Pennsylvania. And having everyone recognize that at once is a really good thing. And I think we're just going to continue to soar um, as far as uh, research and development and spinning out companies. Um, from our great institutions. Yeah, that's great. And obviously it ties into the Tech Hub's uh, announcement that came out last year and sort of the phase two applications were due. And so we'll jump into that a little bit later. But, you know, another key section just in terms of expanding uh, the cell and gene therapy and really looking at 
of stealing the workforce is around biomanufacturing, uh, improving capacity available for the region in terms of workforce, uh, advancing those processes using technology. And I think it was yesterday that marked Mayor Parker's, uh, you know, uh, first sort of took office and 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 term. And so, you know, having someone in her position, you know, the first woman leading city government, really focused on ec- equitable opportunity for all, especially in the life science space. You know, in 2020, the chamber formed the Life Science Talent Pipeline Collaborative, and obviously, you've begun to continue that that legacy. And so. You know, when you think about, I guess, you know, the 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 equitable opportunities that you're talking about and how to um, improve the talent pool, what are some of the, you know, you mentioned some wins earlier, but maybe what are some more of the challenges that you all are facing in that capacity and some of the risks that you have to think about mitigating? Yeah, so, you know, one of the biggest challenges is educating folks, honestly, and educating them about um, why and how they belong in this space. And, and I'm talking like lower school students. Um, it starts, you know, in third, fourth and fifth grade that we need to start talking about the fact that there are positions available to you, no matter your economic means. So I think education and marketing are two of our biggest challenges, but also the literal education. Mm-hmm. We obviously, obviously there's a, a reading in a, in a math Um, requirement behind all of this. So it's really important that we work with the school district, which I I, um, have a life science workforce training solutions convening and the district is present. All the training partners are present. Um, And so we are really working towards um, figuring out how to educate Philadelphians um, to know that they belong in this space and how do we educate them within the rubrics of the school, um, in the school system to bring them to a level where when they graduate high school, that math and that reading requirement piece is a non-issue as far as training for life science. So I think that's the biggest challenge is marketing. Um, I, I've been in Philadelphia maybe 20 years and I noticed that they just don't evangelize because growing up in, in New York and Newark, New Jersey and close by, like I didn't know about the Barnes Foundation. I was really into I'm really into art. Like, so we just don't evangelize here. And I think we're finally starting to do that, to talk, to pat ourselves on the back and talk about how great we are. And that's going to help with the whole marketing piece as well. I think. Yeah. And by marketing, I do mean like just information getting out to people, just everyday people in the city who think you need a PhD to do science. Yeah, I think that's probably the largest misnomer just in terms of the industry is that you have to have a highly technical kind of academic career to actually uh, jump into the biotech sector. And, you know, that's something that I think that we're working on educating through our our partnerships uh, as we evaluate ecosystems for opportunities and and growth. And so a lot of what you discussed ties into this announcement of Philly as a precision medicine hub through uh, the tech hub uh, acknowledgement from from the Biden administration. And, you know, a big part of that for what you all have is really breaking it out. We talked about workforce and access to entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or entrepreneurs rather and mentors having some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, clinical opportunities as well. And so when you think about tapping into federal programs, right, it could be ARPA-H, which is the subsidiary subsidiary of NIH, supports transformative and innovative biomedical breakthroughs. And, you know, the consortium was led by Ben Franklin Technology Partners. I think they've done a fantastic job in convening folks from public and private sectors, from companies, real estate developers, you know, economic developers. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, when you think about the tech hub and the next phase of Philadelphia in that capacity, you know, what, what really resonates with you and your team and, and what do you think the impact inevitably will be, you know, maybe even irregardless of whether, you know, it's formalized and we get the funding or, you know, obviously we've done a lot of legwork um, in the early stages to at least get us to this point. Yeah, so 
the impact, part of the impact is that marketing that I talked about. So people will sit up and recognize Philadelphia for all that we've done because we've been a little quiet about it. And, um, you know, the amount of disease we're curing and treating around the world. A lot of people don't know a lot of those studies and a lot of that work came out of here. So I think um, the tech hub recognition helps with that piece as well. But also what I think is really important and what people will recognize um, and just like that second phase of the application is how collaborative we are. And that has been a true difference for me in doing research in this state and having done research in two other states. Here, I when I was doing my research, if I was stumped and I needed help, I could walk upstairs, I could walk around the corner. You can literally walk between healthcare systems here. So when it comes to doing your clinical trials, collaborating with physicians, um, whether it's you know adult disease, childhood disease, we have it all within like walking distance, which is amazing. But one thing Philadelphia also has, which I think is a huge advantage for this tech, tech hub de designation, is we have a diversity of people. You know, right now, I think a few years back, not a few, but quite a few years back, people started talking about how a lot of times studies were done in just males, right? Because their physiological system is more steady. For a woman, it's up and down like each month. And so there were a lot of studies done in males and not females. And then they thought, found out, oh, we have to like do this in both cohorts because the female physiological requirement may not be the same as a the male. They may need a lower dose of a drug or a higher dose of a drug. So that's one thing. And now, you know, especially through, um, for example, these self-driving cars and recognizing dark complected people, we're also realizing that we also need a diversity of people, people from all over the world, all over the country to do these studies. And that's something I think that will be recognized as well, is that here in Philadelphia, whether it's clinical trials, whether it's, um, you know, other types of testing, we have this pool of people, this diverse pool of people who we can, you know, figure out cures and treatments in a more equitable way um, right here in Philadelphia, yeah. greater Philadelphia area. Yeah. I mean, I, again, diversity of people equals uh, or equates to rather diversity of ideas and, mm -hmm. you know, having the ability to tap into that talent pool, tap into uh, the little level of creativity and innovation that's occurring from, you know, all walks of life really at the end of the day is what I think is a tremendous value for Philadelphia and, you know, obviously the scientific community will benefit from that. And so, you know, when you think about the scientific community in particular, you know, just quickly, maybe what it means to you and how have you seen it evolve? Oh, boy. So, you know, I was fortunate in my lab at Penn. I, I um, feel like Jim Wilson did this well. We had a pretty diverse lab. And as long as you can get the job done, there was just no issue where you were from. But anyway, he just had a diverse set of people and um, was always willing to listen to different ideas and um, uh, perspectives. So that was always nice. Um, but honestly, as I began to collaborate and go outside his lab, I saw that it was very, very different. Um, you just didn't always see that same equity. And we have to remember that Philadelphia is a majority black city. There's a lot of people of color here. We, you know, now we have a lot of folks who are immigrating to Philadelphia as well. Um, and so I think now we're starting to see people recognize this. And honestly, it's everywhere. Like when I think about like listening to the news on the radio, like NPR or list or watching the news on television. There was a time that if you had an accent, you know, you they wouldn't give you that job. You had to sound a certain way all the time, you know. And so I think we're seeing it grow in science. I think we're seeing it grow in the world around us, um, where people from other places are taken more seriously and not looked down upon and um you know, their ideas are valued. I mean, we saw that with the um, Nobel Prize for 
Catalin Karika. I mean, she's a scientist, a woman from Hungary, you know, who people didn't listen to for a long time, you know, but um, now she's just completely revered because a lot of us are sitting here talking to you, talking to one another today because of technology that she and Dr. Weissman helped pioneer. So I think it's getting better. And I think people are recognizing that that diversity of thought and perspectives is more valuable. Yeah. And I mean, Philadelphia, the one thing you have is just a, a wide breadth of celebrity scientists and, <laughs> you know, taking advantage of that pipeline. And so it's really uh, important, I think, to also think about then, you know, who's next? What's the next generation going to bring? And, and I think a lot of that is is a diversity of perspective that, you know, only at the end of the day, uh, among other things, really supports health disparities, supports uh, folks looking at the end of the day to improve their quality of life, because you're not creating medicines for the healthy. You're creating medicines and therapeutics for those that are really at the end of the day, don't have too many other options. And so I think it's just a really important uh, part of this ecosystem. And really, I think part of just the sector to understand that the reason these medicines are commercializing is because a lot of these scientists are dedicated to solving those health outcomes rather yeah. than trying to make money. And obviously there's benefits to that too. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said there. And, you know, you've been nominated uh, as a BioBuzz Awards finalist. And, uh, you know, BioBuzz obviously has a a great reputation. Uh, their team is small and mighty. And, you know, what does that mean to you and, and your team to be uh, acknowledged as a, as a finalist for BioBuzz Awards? Yeah. So I think um, this is really, it, it means a lot to me because one thing I've come to understand working for the Department of Commerce, we do so much behind the scenes to keep businesses in our ecosystem functioning in Philadelphia, but yet we're a quiet storm. No one knows who we are. No, you know, they don't, people don't realize we touch, you know, every type of business in the city. So me being recognized for this also me makes me happy for my team because I don't do it alone. So I feel like we're all being recognized um, and recognize that we're be the glue and the catalyst that keep, you know, the cogs in, in turning <laughs> in this system. Yeah. Um, and personally, uh, I feel really, really great about it because this, this, the whole workforce, so I'm nominated as a workforce champion and the whole workforce yeah. piece was so important to me when I came on to commerce and I saw that people were creating equity around science um, through workforce development and, you know, immediately I just hit the ground running and I, and it's also recognition that this convening that I started with all the workforce partners is meaningful. Um, it was very scary to do because literally I started this convening by sending an email to 50 people hoping that it would cause some sort of collaboration. We in Philadelphia, a lot of times hold things close to the chest. So um, it's a beautiful thing to be recognized and to see this collaboration, at least in this space happening. I feel like in science, we do collaborate as scientists because scientists have this altruistic view of curing disease and we wanna just you know make everything better. But then individual programs can you know, be a little siloed sometimes. We can be doing the same things in parallel and not know it. So it it really means a lot to me and it means a lot um, to my team. And I, I really share this recognition with them. And honestly, there's an adage that you'll see in my office and that I love to say, and that's, I'm not interested in competing with anyone. I hope we all make it. And that's my thing when it comes to science. I just hope we all make it. <laughs> So, yeah, that's incredible. Well, Dr. Grant, I really appreciate your time today. Obviously, Sheer Partners is invested in seeing the Philadelphia life science ecosystem thrive. We play a very small part, but it's evident that in speaking with folks that are passionate like you, uh, in speaking with obviously fellow nominees, that everyone's very invested into the city and seeing it grow and grow in an equitable way. And so, 
Uh, it's my goal to really raise the profile of Philadelphia, again, playing a small part, elevate the voices of leaders in the space. And we're just very grateful for you joining us today for Bioblast. Yeah, no, I'm so grateful for you on. I'm definitely grateful for Share Partners. I work with them quite a bit. So um, they're just another great part of our ecosystem. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we will see you shortly here and uh, hope you have a great weekend. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.